Friends, join me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, draw near to us once more. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so the second scripture lesson for today comes from Matthew's Gospel, from the 26th chapter, verses 36 through 46. Listen for God's word. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Jesus took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. And then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, Jesus threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then Jesus came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again Jesus went away for the second time and prayed, Abba, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, then your will be done. Again, Jesus came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away, and he prayed for the third time, saying the same words. And then he came back to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners, so rise, get up, let us be going, for my betrayer is at hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I mentioned, in the course of this service, we have moved from the triumphant Palm Sunday cheers to Jesus' whispered prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane, from shouted hosannas to Breezes rustling the olive trees and Jesus asking that the cup of suffering might somehow be taken away from him. It's a dramatic change of events. But it begs the question, why did Matthew include this story in his gospel? Matthew's composing a narrative that's designed to convince his readers that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah the Son of God. So why not just focus on the miracle stories? Focus on the adoring crowds shouting on Palm Sunday. Why continue to a somewhat awkward Last Supper where Judas is going to be identified as a thief and the betrayer of Christ? And then go on to describe this garden scene in which Jesus himself is deeply troubled and grieved and prays to be delivered from a fate that will include a cross. The simple answer is that Matthew wanted to include those things because that's what happened. And his goal was to provide an honest description of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the deeper answer is that Matthew told us about what happened in that Garden of Gethsemane because at some point in our own lives, we will find ourselves in that same garden, either praying or keeping vigil or both. Matthew wants us to know that in those moments, God is with us. And for Matthew, that is good news. So two things were happening simultaneously there in the Garden of Gethsemane. First and foremost, it was a time of intense prayer by Jesus. He led the group of disciples out of the city of Jerusalem and up onto the nearby Mount of Olives. But there he chose not to pray together as a group, as they'd done earlier at the meal. But now he goes off by himself to pray alone. But Jesus had done this before. We're told once after healing lots of people in the city of Capernaum, he got up early in the morning, and Scripture says he went off by himself to pray alone in a deserted place. And later on, after feeding a crowd of 5,000 from just a few loaves and fish, 
Jesus sent his disciples across the sea in their own boat while he went off alone on a mountaintop to pray. It seems at important points in his ministry, Jesus always needed time to reconnect through prayer, to draw on that fundamental unity that marked his relationship with God. And we've all had somewhat similar moments, times when we just have to get away from others, times when we need to go for a walk and clear our heads, or sit in a rocking chair, or on a couch with a thick, a thick blanket, and just think things through. In those moments, while we're walking or seated, we end up talking both to ourselves and to God at the same time. In critical moments, Jesus relied on prayer. And that is an important reminder for us to do the same. The preacher David Buttrick once said that <clears throat> prayer is not a substitute for working or thinking or watching or suffering or grieving. Prayer is a fundamental support for all of those other things. Prayer is what we need to do when big things, hard things, important things need to get done. So in addition to praying, the second thing that was happening in the Garden of Gethsemane was that it was a time of vigil. Jesus told the larger group of disciples to stay back while he went off to pray. Then he called Peter, James, and John to come with him, and he told them explicitly to keep vigil, to stay awake. Now the word vigil generally has three meanings. It used to refer to the late night watch of soldiers who were told to keep vigil and to protect the surroundings from enemy threats. Vigil also referred to the evening before important religious festivals like the vigil of Christmas Eve or the Saturday vigil as congregation members would await the first light of Easter morning. But nowadays, we mostly hear the word vigil when someone is dying, when a spouse or a family member is there waiting at the bedside, keeping watch. I read one religious writer who talked about sitting beside her grandmother's bed during her final hours, keeping vigil by her side. My own parents died about 10 years ago, and in both cases, I remember being nearby and keeping vigil with my siblings. There is nothing you can do in those last hours, nothing that will extend their lives. In those moments, all you can do is wait and watch, speak reassuring words of love, and pray to God. During COVID, many of you have been denied the physical proximity with those you love, particularly in these times of final vigils, when you've been forced to watch and wait and pray from a distance. And I know that's been incredibly hard for many of you. But whether your vigil is something that happens right beside or absent from the person you love, it is a time of hyper-vigilance, of hyper-awareness, as well as a time that can be exhausting. Because in those moments, you are alert to every sound. You are noticing the changes in the person's breathing. You are waiting for more updates from doctors or nurses. Even as you're aware of your own aches and pains and your own breathing, your own moments of hunger or boredom or wanting to be asleep. The spirit is willing, but the flesh interrupts the vigil with its own needs. If ever you felt guilty about keeping an imperfect vigil, then the story of the sleeping disciples offers very real comfort. It reminds us that no one is perfect. And even more so, it tells us this point. Keeping vigil and praying to God are both forms of paying attention. And whatever we lack in these moments, in these skills, God understands, God forgives, and God is with us. I'll say more about this in a moment. The author Kathleen Norris 
used to be a substitute art teacher in small schools, particularly elementary level classrooms. And so when she would visit a classroom, in order to help the students learn how to focus, she would make a deal with them. She would say, you can first make all the noise you want, but then after that, you must be silent. When she would raise her hand, she would tell them to make all the noise that was possible as they sat at their desk. They could shout, they could clamp, they could stomp their feet, whatever. And the students' eyes would grow wide with anticipation. But they had to stop when she lowered her hand. Now Norris found that it usually took two or three repetitions before the kids learned how to make an acceptable din. But the rules for being silent were also fairly simple. Second and third graders, she had to remind them, don't hold your breath, don't make funny faces, just breathe normally, just sit and be quiet. And this also took a couple repetitions for them to get right. Invariably, a pencil would roll down someone's desk or one of the students would shift in their chair. But Norris always found that the children were able to be so still that silence became an actual presence in the classroom. Now, some kids loved it. They were amazed that the classroom could become so silent, but others weren't so sure. One boy said, it's scary. It's like we're waiting for something, but it still feels scary. Recognizing this, Norris would ask the kids to describe what it was like to make noise and what it was like to be silent. Now, the children's descriptions of the noise were filled with fairly common cliches. They would say, well, it sounded like we were a herd of elephants or in the middle of a big thunderstorm. But when they would describe the silence, the poets emerged from within. One boy wrote that silence is like a tree spreading its branches to the sun. One girl offered what became a prayer when she said silence is like spiders spinning their webs. It's like a silkworm making its silk. Lord, help me to know when to be silent. But Norris's favorite description came from a little girl at a tiny school in western North Dakota who wrote this. Silence reminds me to take my soul with me wherever I go. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Silence reminds us to take our souls with us wherever we go. Both are wise words to live by. Now, as I said earlier, two things were happening simultaneously there in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a time of prayer, of Jesus turning to God, God who is our guide, our strength. But it was also a vigil where the disciples were waiting and watching, often in silence, often exhausted, unsure, and imperfectly executed by them. So it was a prayer plus a vigil. And yes, it's true, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But when Jesus said this, he wasn't chiding us. He was simply stating a fact. Vigils are hard, and our flesh is weak. But God's spirit, the source of our spirit, is truly willing. God's grace is made perfect in our weakness. So be still and know that God is God. Be still and remember to take your soul with you wherever you go. Prayers and vigils are not about doing. They're about being. They are about attentiveness, being attentive to God's work in our lives and in the world. St. Benedict long ago said that there's a double dynamic present in every genuine encounter with God. There's the honest awareness of our unworthiness, of our need for forgiveness and strength. 
as our eyes sometimes droop while we try to keep vigils as best we can. And there's the awareness of God's superabundant mercy, this grace that literally fills the silence with something tangible that surrounds us and holds us and keeps us safe when we feel alone, that is able to answer the prayers of our lips and the prayers of our hearts. And so like I said earlier, Matthew told us about what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane because at some point in our lives, we will invariably find ourselves in the same situation, either praying fervently or keeping vigil imperfectly or both at once. Matthew wants us to know that in the end, each of us, is forgiven for our failings even as we are encouraged and sustained for the journey ahead. So in this part of Matthew's story, after he takes us to the garden, he has Jesus in the prayer vigil by saying to the disciples, rise, get up, let us be going. And later the risen Christ will once more extend that same helping hand to us and encourage us once more to get up to rise and be going, promising to accompany us even to the end of the age, trusting in that love and in that grace. May it be so. Amen.